upload a revised version um, for you. So what I want to do today is cover the material, most of it, that we would have covered on Wednesday. Again, I don't know why I, I could not find a lecture covering this material because I know I've recorded it. Um, which is the reading drama, the intro to drama kind of stuff, the backgrounds of drama, and then what we had for today, background of Shakespeare. We will not get to Acts 1 and 2 of Midsummer Night's Dream. So we're going to start off um, a little bit behind, but I think we'll be able to catch up. So I'm going to do essentially what I did in that lecture that you watched, if you watched it the other day, um, and just hit the bold print words for most of these pages. Some I'm going to skip because they are common sense. For example, playwright. Somebody who writes a play. Okay, pretty easy. Um, same with plays. You know, literature written to be performed by actors on a stage. Drama is a little different. Page 1384. Drama derives from the Greek word drawn, meaning to do or perform. So a drama is something meant to be performed. That's it. That's all it is. Okay. Script, everybody knows what that is. That's the, that's the text of a drama. That's what the actors are working from. Okay. Here's something you might not be familiar with, because I don't think this is covered at all in high school English courses. Closet dramas. As we said, dramas are meant to be performed. The closet part of closet drama negates that. Closet dramas are dramas not meant to be performed. They're solely meant to be read. Okay? Um, you don't get many of those written today, but there are some throughout history. Uh, John Milton wrote a, drama, wrote a closet drama back in the 17th century called Comus. Okay. It's more meant to be read than performed. It has been performed. It's really bad in terms of performance. Okay. Um, what else? We can skip from the reading drama and jump up to page 1401. So if you just got to 1383, jump to 1401. Elements of drama. Okay. What the components of drama. And your editor starts with a one-act play. Not sure why, other than that, between those two sections, you had a play by Susan Glassbill called Trifles. It's a one-act play. It, it does not take very long to perform. That's probably why it begins with that. Shouldn't, however, should begin with full act or full plays, typically five acts, like a Shakespearean play. Okay? But what's an act? An act is what we would call a convention. By convention, that means something everybody agrees upon. Okay? For example, it's a convention to say, this is a telephone or iPhone. Okay? We could, if we all agreed, we could say, this is a bottle. If we all agree, that is, by calling it a phone, that's just a convention. When Alexander Graham Bell invented these things, he pulled that word kind of out of the air. Why? Because tele means distance, phone, sound. Sound over distance. Kind of like television. Something you see over a distance. Okay? But he could have just as well have called it something else. And we would all agree that's what it is. Okay, So it's a convention to say full-length plays are divided into acts and scenes. But you're not really aware of acts and scenes when you see a full-length play. Or when you see a film. But films are divided into acts and scenes too. Okay, So where do you see an act change in a play? How many of you have seen a live play, a live production of a play? Where does that occur? When does that occur? Louder. 
possibly when the lights go off, or sometimes when the screen or curtain closes. How else is it indicated? If there isn't lighting change or curtain close. Say that again. Okay, possibly in the location if the scenery changes. Okay. Typically in a Shakespearean play, you don't see either, you don't see any of those three things. Okay. The way you know there's an act change is when the stage is empty for a moment. It's when there are no characters on the stage. Now it might be. If this is the doorway leading out, and imagine there's another doorway over there, it might be that one person, the last person, is leaving the stage like this, just as somebody else enters. So heel comes off, foot steps in. That's an act change. They don't have, you know, somebody come out with a placard saying act two. Right? So what's the difference between an act change and a scene change? If an act changes when there is, for a moment at least, nobody on stage, a scene change is whenever a new character enters or leaves. So you've got a group of actors, a group of characters on the stage, somebody comes in. That's usually a scene change. Okay. Shakespeare shows us because Shakespeare gives us stage directions. So and so, exempt. So and so enters, and that usually comes at or before a scene change. Not all the time, however. Okay? Sometimes the scene change is literally the scene changes. But in most Shakespearean productions, that doesn't actually change. The background doesn't change. If you go to the Midsummer Night Stream in Nashville at Centennial Park this weekend and next weekend, um, you will see they do that. They actually change the background, kind of, I mean, partially, okay? Setting. What's the setting for a story or a play? How many of you did start reading Midsummer Night's Dream? A couple. Where is it set? Athens, Greece, okay? There's another setting within the play, and it's in wood outside Athens. So you have Athens itself, and then a wood outside. Shakespeare likes this image, by the way. He does it in a couple of his plays, where you have a city and a wild place outside the city, where all kinds of strange things happen. Okay? Where is the Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien set? Middle Earth. Okay? Where is Star Wars set? You know, at the very beginning of the first film, because you see the words in a galaxy far, far away. You know? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far, it's not, you know, we're not in Kansas, in other words, Toto. Okay? Kansas and wherever, Oz, okay? So, setting can be actual location, physical topography, okay? What else can setting be? Time. Midsummer Night's Dream is not set in the time that Shakespeare's writing. It's not set in 1596 Athens. It is set when Athens? A long time ago. It is set in the Athens of myth. How do we know? Because Theseus is the Duke, and he's getting ready to marry whom? Hippolyta, queen of of the Amazons. Okay. That's way, way, that's before recorded history in mythological time. Okay? So it can be time as well as place. What else can it be? Atmosphere. Atmosphere. What do you mean? Okay. Kind of the cultural milieu in which it is set. Um, how many of you have read Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter? Some of you had that inflicted upon you, I know, in high school. Okay. Would Scarlet Letter work in August 
2018 New England. That is, you're a struggling writer, and you're working on the next great American novel. And The Scarlet Letter was never written by Hawthorne. And you're writing The Scarlet Letter. Would it work? Set in 2018? No. Why not? Because adultery is no longer the issue that it was. I mean, I personally, I would disagree with that. But it's not the social issue. It doesn't have the social stigma that it had in, say, 1680 Massachusetts. Okay? When the Puritans were in control. So that social atmosphere, the religious atmosphere, the cultural atmosphere, okay, can have a pretty strong bearing on a work. Difference between 1960s America, 1930s America, 1960s America, 1980s America, 1980s America, today. The difference between today, 2018, and this month, 2016. Some people would say the difference between November 7th, 2016, and November 9th, 2016, you know, or how about September 10th, 2001, and September 12th, 2001. The world shifted, you know, in a sense, at least for Americans, on September 11th, 2001, because we used to think we're impermeable. Nobody can touch us. And then they touched us, you know. So all those are aspects of setting. Suspense, I'm not going to talk about. Y'all know what suspense is. Exposition. Exposition is what I've just been doing. Exposition is background information you need in order to understand what it is you're reading. So, for example, Star Wars, the first film. Those words going up the screen... That's exposition. That's giving us background information we need in order to understand what happens when we see that first star cruiser come over the top of the screen. Okay? How many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings films? Most of you probably. Here's some of you. <coughs> Where do we get the exposition in that? First one. It's the opening five, ten minutes. It's hearing Kate Blanchett, a.k.a. Galadriel's voice, telling us about the history of the ring. Okay? That's not how Tolkien does it. Tolkien gives us all that background, background information that we need in two chapters in the first volume of The Lord of the Rings. Okay? The second chapter of the first half, called um, Shadow of the Past, and the second chapter of the second half, called the Council of Elrond. It's in those two chapters, Tolkien gives us all the background information we need in order to understand everything else that happens in the rest of the novel. Okay? Dialogue, we don't need to discuss. Um, 1402, conflict we don't need to discuss because conflict is at the heart of human existence. You don't have literature without conflict. Well, to some extent. You don't have novels. You don't have dramas without conflict. You can't have poems without conflict. You can have all kinds of poetry without conflict. Okay? But you can't have a human interaction without some kind of conflict. Why? Because I am not you and you am not I. <laughs> That's it. And we don't always see eye to eye. Okay? Plot. Everybody knows what plot is, right? Until you're asked to define it. So define plot. You could give me the textbook definition, the author's arrangement of incidents in a story or play. So give me an example. But take it out of the realm of literature. Give me an example of plot in the real world. Let's say the 2016 presidential election. How does that plot out? Does it start? 2016? Nope. When did it begin? I don't remember who was the first one to announce. But it begins in 2015, if not 2014. It seems to me somebody announced that they were running for president in late 2014. 
I mean, everybody knew Hillary Clinton was going to run. Nobody knew Donald Trump was going to run in 2014. We knew a bunch of Republicans were going to run. I mean, we knew Jeb Bush was going to run. And, you know, I think Ted Cruz was already making noise. But you could plot that out by saying, such and such a date, X person announces, I'm running for the presidency. And then another date, somebody else, and then another 20 dates, so that we end up with the 20 Republicans running. Okay, And then we have, you know, uh, I think we had at most seven Democrats running. And then you keep plotting that out, and what happens? Well, you start having the primaries. Okay, These are the arrangements of that election. The primaries come, so-and-so wins, so-and-so loses, so-and-so drops out, et cetera, et cetera. And we end up with two nominees, well, Three nominees if you include Jill Stein, and four nominees if you include, or five or however many there were. I think there are actually about 20 by the time you get to the end of it, because you got all these minor parties, etc. But all of those included as well. And then we could plot out what happened incident. I mean, since then. So notice, plot out like on a graph. Okay? So we could take any story, any drama, any play, and we could outline the plot. If you're familiar with Pixar and Disney, what did Pixar and Disney do, and what did they do, going back to the first Disney films, for every film? Any of you in animation major by any chance? You've got storyboards. You have a room like this, and the walls are covered with what? The plot of every scene drawn out so that you can have a visual quick idea of what's going on. Okay. Subplot, pretty easy. It's a minor plot underneath that. What's the major plot in Midsummer Night's Dream? The play opens with what is getting ready to happen. Some of you said you had started reading it. A wedding. Theseus, Hippolyta. They are getting married when? Four days' time. That's the overarching plot. Then you get subplots. And Jesus comes in, he says, My Lord, I want my daughter to marry Demetrius. Hermia, his daughter, says, I don't want to marry Demetrius. I don't love Demetrius. I love Lysander. Lysander loves me. We should marry. What happens if I don't marry Demetrius? And the Duke announces, well, one of three things. One, you do marry Demetrius, even though you don't love him. Two, if you don't do that, then you die, because that's what the law allows. Or three, you remain a virgin the rest of your life, and you become a nun to the goddess Diana, who is the goddess of virginity and chastity. So think about this, Hermia. Why? Because she's young. And what he's implying there is, your hormones are raging. Can you remain a virgin the rest of your life? You have four days to decide, by the way. So the day I'm going to get married might be the day you die. Not a good way to start off one's wedding day, by the way. Okay? So that's a subplot. All right? That's also the introduction of the conflict in that play. Okay? So protagonist, antagonist. What do we tend to think a protagonist is? Main character. What does protagonist mean? Notice what word is in that. Okay, pro is a prefix. Agony. Pro usually means what? Like pro and con. Pro there means what? In pro and con. Good or in support of or positive. Positive agony. Wrap your mind around that. How can you have positive pain? Pro there means it's protagon, it's protos, which doesn't mean good or in support of. It means first, chief, number one, agony. It's the main sufferer. Okay. Why? Why do we use that term instead of hero, main character? Because it comes from Aristotle. We'll talk about Aristotle later. I'm kind of doing this a little bit out of order. Um, so that we can start with the Midsummer Night's Dream so you can see the play and we'll talk about it and then we go kind of back in, in time a little bit. 
um, from Aristotle. And Aristotle wrote about Greek drama based upon tragedy. And what do you have in tragedies? Sufferers. So you got a lot of people who suffer, but the most important one is the chief sufferer, the protos agonist. So for example, all of Shakespeare's tragedies are named after a person. The tragedy of Richard III, the tragedy of Julius Caesar, the tragedy of Antony and Cleopatra, the tragedy of Macbeth, the tragedy of Othello, okay, the tragedy of Hamlet. Guess what? The people they're named after, those are the ones who suffer the most. But we're going to read another tragedy in here where even though the tragedy is named after a person, that might not be the person who suffers the most, even though that person dies. We kind of think, wait, if somebody dies, that's the greatest suffering there is. Not necessarily. Think about those who live on. Sometimes dying is the easy part. It's those who survive who've got to pay the price. Okay? Antagonist. It's got that ant in front of it, right? meaning anti, in opposition to. So in the Star Wars universe, who is the antagonist to Luke Skywalker? Darth Vader, right? In the Harry Potter universe, who is the antagonist to Harry Potter? Lord Voldemort. Okay. In the Bugs Bunny universe, who's the antagonist to Wile E. Coyote? The road runner, okay? Why? Because that's the person who causes the problems for the protagonist. In The Lord of the Rings, the antagonist for Bilbo, excuse me, for Frodo, is not Gollum. It's Sauron. Or if you want, it's the ring, okay, which is representative of Sauron. Okay? What else? Uh, stage directions pretty close, pretty um, straightforward. Pyramidal pattern, that's this. You can plot out, or chart if you want, tragedies as a pyramid. Play opens, play begins here, and then you get what? You get the exposition. You get background information, and you have what's called the rising action. Why is it rising? It's building to the climax of the play. Suspense is building, okay? You get the complication. Think of, how many of you have seen the film Jaws? Only a few of you. They see this, you know, culturally illiterate. It's, it's just, how does Jaws begin? For those of you who have seen it? Someone dies. Yeah, you got a guy and a girl on a beach. She goes off skinny dipping in the ocean. And she's out there swimming, and then we hear, Donna, Donna. And she jumps up out of the water, not jumping. <laughs> being thrown by the great white, etc., and she dies, okay? That's, that's our complication. That's our conflict. And it builds and builds and builds until we have Clint's boat, Quint's boat, being essentially devoured by this giant shark, etc. And the shark being blown up by, I can't remember uh, Richie Jurgens' character's name. And then you have the resolution. In a tragedy, at the resolution, at the end of the play, do they all live happily ever after? No, not really. If you've ever seen Hamlet, Hamlet ends with a bunch of bodies on the stage. Hamlet's dead, his mother's dead, his uncle slash stepfather's dead, his friend is dead. Okay. Tragedies end with a rupture in society that happens at the beginning of the play resolved, but it's not resolved peacefully and happily. Okay? You then flip that pyramid pattern over and you have comedy. Comedy begins, okay? and you have, even though it's rising action, that is, you have suspense and all that kind of stuff, it can be thought of also as a falling action. Because comedy begins, and you have also a rupture in society. Every one of Shakespeare's comedies could become a tragedy. Every one of Shakespeare's tragedies could.
could become a comedy. It's at this point in each of them okay, that they become what they are. It's at this point that Hamlet becomes a tragedy. Or it's at this point that Oedipus the King that we'll be reading in a couple of few days becomes a tragedy. It's at this point that A Midsummer Night's Dream becomes a comedy. It's when the four lovers are appropriately, properly paired that we know, oh good, Hermia's is not going to die. That it then rises and comes to the peaceful, happy conclusion for almost all involved. Even in Shakespeare's happiest comedies, there is at least one person in the society who's not happy at the end. Midsummer Night's Dream, I'll give you the end. Hermia marries the man she loves, even though her father is against it. So at the end of that play, he doesn't get his wish. You think he's happy here at the very end? Not really. Does he go along? Yeah. Why? Because his Lord tells him to. Okay. Um, climax, the you know, action reaches a final crisis. Falling action, resolution, all that. Okay. Foil, bottom of 1403. What's a foil? A foil is a character who brings out okay, the main qualities, or the good qualities if you want, or the central qualities of the main character. I know your introduction says a character whose behavior and values contrast with the protagonist up to a point. Yeah, that's kind of it. But a, a real foil brings out the hero's real strong points. So, how many of you have read any of the Harry Potter novels or seen any of the Harry Potter films? Most of you. Who is a foil for Harry? Who does he immediately take a disliking to when he meets him? Draco Malfoy. Why? What does Draco Malfoy stand for? He's a muggle hater. He's a muggle hater. There he was raised by muggles. <laughs> what else? He's a racist. He's prejudiced. He's an idiot. We can go on if you want. And Harry's none of those things. They're there, they're in Madame Malkin's, they're getting measured for their robes, and Malfoy sees Hagrid and says some kind of unnice things about him. He says, you know, I don't think his kind ought to be allowed. And Harry's like, oh, that's not very inclusive of you. Let's, you know, let's accept everybody then, kind of mentality. Malfoy, by showing his colors, allows Harry to show his true colors. Right. Star Wars. Who's a foil for Luke Skywalker? Other than Darth Vader, obviously. How about Han Solo? Han Solo brings out Luke's good quality. Why? Where does Han put all of his trust? What's all of his faith in? A good blaster. You know. Give me an Uzi, and I can solve all the problems in the world. Luke learns what? The biggest gun in the world isn't going to solve your problems. Why? Because what does Obi-Wan teach him? Obi-Wan's not a foil. He's a mentor. Okay? He teaches him what? Trust in the force, Luke. So when he gets ready to destroy the Death Star, what does he do against all reason? shuts off this, the targeting computer. And they're all like, Luke, what the hell are you doing? This is your last shot. The force, Luke, trust in your guy. Okay, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> all right? So that's foil. Theme we don't need to discuss. You know, Theme's the main point or message or idea the author is trying to get across. I don't think I've ever asked this question in one of these courses before. 
What's the theme of Star Wars? Is it belief? Is it that, that poster you'll see starting to appear in stores in about another month or two of the big fat guy in the red suit with the packages and everything with one word? Belief. Is it belief? Is it trust in the unknown? It's definitely not trust in the biggest guns. Okay. Um, skip from there to no, not Oedipus to Shakespeare. Background: A study of William Shakespeare. And jump to. Um, 1538. We'll talk a little bit about Shakespeare's chronology in a moment. <clears throat> and time is running out quickly. Drama has three main periods in human history. The first main period is ancient Greece and Rome. It arose in religious in the religious festivals of ancient Greece. It arose at its very beginning. You had one person on stage. So it wasn't really. You have one person on stage talking to the people. What do you have? Monologue, right? It's, it's, it's speech. It's lecture. It's you know. It's not drama as we think of it. Why? Drama is a performance. Yeah, you can have one person doing a one-man show, so to speak. But it doesn't really become kind of the drama that we think of until you get a second character. Right? So after a while, a second character is brought in. After a while, then, you get a third character. In the three great main tragedies of ancient Greece, you have Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles. Right? I think Aeschylus who introduces the second or third character. I can't remember which. Okay? And that drama lasts until roughly the end of the Roman Empire, about 400 AD. So throughout the ancient Greek period and all the Roman period, you've got plays being written and performed. Okay? And in the ancient Greek period, in the 5th century, the 400 BC period, I mean, you got tons of plays. Because by that time, they're no longer solely associated with the religious festivals. Now you have essentially like our Academy Awards. I mean, you have festivals, just the plays being produced to determine who's going to win that award. Okay? Like the con, you know, Palm Ward for the con film. Then they die out. Why? Because the Roman Empire goes kaput. And there are no dramas written for a period of roughly six to seven hundred years. And it starts to rise again in the eh, middle to late Middle Ages, around 1,000, 1100 AD. 1100, more 11 to 1200. Where does it arise? Again, it arises church. Okay. Where does it arise? In the Easter ceremonies of the medieval English church. Somebody comes up with the idea that in the English ritual, in, in, in the, the mass ritual of the English Catholic church, somebody comes up with the idea of, hey, we should have another person, not the priest, we should have another person Come in, and rather than just reading these passages of Scripture, we should have someone come in and say, Where have you laid our Lord? The passage from the Gospels where the three Marys run to the tomb on the morning of Christ's resurrection, and they meet the gardener because Jesus ain't there. Where have you laid him? And the angel replies, He is not here. He has risen from the dead as he foretold. Notice what you have right there. You have dialogue. And initially, that just begins. One person, 
Where have you laid our Lord? He is not here. He is risen as he foretold. Go seek him in Galilee. That's the beginnings of the English drama. Okay? It develops so that you get three kinds of drama through the Middle Ages. Page 1538, third paragraph. Mystery plays. Okay? Dramatized stories from the Bible, such as creation, fall of Adam and Eve, crucifixion, the flood. There's another one actually called the flood. There's one called the crucifixion. You have the sacrifice of Isaac, another one. Okay. So those are mystery plays, dramatizing stories and events from the Bible. Okay. Miracle plays are based on the lives of saints. Miracle plays are about saints. So you have a whole bunch of plays. Um, for example, Mary Magdalene. You've got a play about Noah. You've got a play about Daniel in the lion's den. Okay? You've got plays about Christ. So those are miracle plays. And then you have morality plays. Morality plays are allegories. Okay? It's this. In an allegory, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between a symbol and what that symbol represents. For example... In the greatest allegory written in the English language, a novel by a writer in the 17th century named John Bunyan, he wrote a novel called Pilgrim's Progress. The name of the pilgrim is Christian. Guess what Christian never maybe um, interpreted as? You can never interpret Christian as atheist. You can never interpret Christian as Jew or Buddhist or Muslim or any other religious or non-religious orientation at all. Nope, it can only be Christian. Similarly, when Christian meets a variety of people like sin, sin never represents virtue. Sin is always sin. Death is always death. Despondency is always despondency, etc. Okay? So when an author writes this kind of allegory, the author is saying, I am author and God, and you must read it this way. You can't interpret it however you want. We're not going to be reading any allegories. When we read a variety of stuff that we read, the interpretation will be somewhat open. That doesn't mean that when you read A Midsummer Night's Dream, you get to interpret it as Shakespeare is writing about alien visitation and abduction by alien. Because mm -hmm. I would say, show me. <laughs> show me where the text suggests little green, it's not there. In other words, the interpretation has got to be based on, on what's there. Okay? That's allegory. So you got all kinds of allegorical plays written in the Middle Ages, and they're almost never produced today. Why? Because they're boring. All they are is teaching. They are entirely didactic. They're like visual sermons. It's what they are. They're homilies that are acted out. Right? But those eventually develop into the kinds of plays that Shakespeare then writes. So, page 13, uh, excuse me, 1539, couple of terms. Aside and soliloquy. Anybody know what an aside is? If you've seen any plays, have you ever seen the scene asides or TV series? There's one television series, it's off the air now, it's on reruns and such, that, you know, they broke the quote unquote fourth wall, which is the Imaginary wall between the characters on the set and the audience. If you've ever seen The Office, what are they frequently doing? Talking right at the camera. Okay? That's like an aside. In an aside, a character on stage looks directly at the audience and speaks to the audience. What that has meant is that nobody on stage heard that. So in Hamlet, which we'll do in a week or so, Hamlet has a scene fairly uh, early on 
where the king, his uncle slash stepfather, okay, says something to him. And Hamlet looks at the audience and says, little less than kin, but more than kind. Okay. And if you understand the meaning behind Hamlet's words, kin and kind, then you get the aside. Then you go, whoa. Because Hamlet just said something about his uncle slash stepfather. Okay? Soliloquy. A soliloquy occurs when there is one actor alone on the stage. Nobody else can be on the stage. And when the actor speaks, the actor is telling us the character's inmost thoughts. That is, everything an actor says in a soliloquy is what the character really, truly believes to be. And then your editor says the greatest example in the English language is Hamlet's to be or not to be. That's not true. That is not a soliloquy. For the simple reason, Hamlet is not alone on the stage. In Shakespeare's play, as it has come down to us, when Hamlet enters the scene, at 3, scene 1, for that quote-unquote soliloquy, there is still another person on the stage. And that other person does not leave the stage before Hamlet speaks. That other person stays there throughout the soliloquy. She is out there reading on a little book. It's Ophelia. Doesn't mean she's right next to Hamlet and thus hears everything. She might be all the way at the other end of the stage in the far corner. But she is still on the stage. So, technically speaking, that's not a soliloquy. And if it's not a soliloquy, then how it is often read needs to be adjusted. Right? Um, okay, Shakespeare, his range of his drama and all that kind of stuff. Shakespeare wrote three major kinds of plays. He wrote comedies, tragedies, and histories. Comedy is pretty straightforward. Most of his comedies are romantic comedies. That is, there is some kind of love interest involved. Okay? And there's, the conflict is, is you know, Something impedes the love interest, and that something's got to be resolved. Okay? Histories are not just general histories. They are English history. So even though Shakespeare writes about ancient Rome, ancient Greece, those aren't histories. Most of those are tragedies or comedies. The history plays are solely about English history. Okay? And then you have the tragedies, set in a wide variety of places. Ancient Rome, ancient Greece, ancient Britain, ancient Germany, with Hamlet. Um, you don't need to talk about comic relief because everybody understands what that is. Satire, bottom of 1542. Give me a modern example of satire. Something you could read or watch almost daily. In fact, I just used a word that is in one of them. The Daily Show. Okay. Saturday Night Live. The Onion. Babylon Bee. Are all examples, or can be, of satire. Depending upon how they are intended and how they are received. In other words, Alec Baldwin doing Donald Trump on Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live. What's the purpose of that? Is it just to make fun of Trump? I would say, yeah, it actually probably is. It's probably really not center. But we'll be more generous and say, no, it's not just to make fun of Trump. It's to make fun of Trump for what purpose? Louder. Okay, what else? 
to get him to change. See, the purpose of satire is to hold up ridicule to a person or persons or class of people or an entire society to do what? To change. Look what a damn fool you are being. Stop being a fool. Stop acting like an idiot. Right? So, the purpose of satire is actually constructive. Satire and parody are different. Parody is just meant to tear down. Parody is meant to ridicule. Um, I can't think of a good example. Monty Python and the Holy Grail is an example of parody. It's a parody of medieval romances. You know, the King Arthur and the Holy Grail. Why? You can't, you can't get King Arthur to reform. Because he's dead. You can't get the whole medieval romance tradition to change. So all you can do is make fun of it by changing certain things. Okay? With comedy, you've got two kinds. High comedy and low comedy. High comedy requires intellect. You have to pay attention to catch the high comedy. High comedy is usually verbal. It's words said. Low comedy is usually action. It's slapstick. If you've ever seen them, it's the Three Stooges. It's Mo poking the eyes of Curly or Larry. It's Curly or Larry smacking Mo upside the head. It's Chevy Chase back in his SNL days tripping when he enters the stage. Okay. It's any time you have somebody getting hurt. You know, in the Bugs Bunny cartoon, it's whatever happens to Wiley e. Coyote. It's having an anvil dropped on your head. That's meant to be funny. Yeah, in the real world, it wouldn't be. But it's not the real world. Okay? Verbal comedy, or the high comedy, means your brain has got to be engaged. Shakespeare uses both in the same play. Why? He's got to appeal to all of his, of his audience. All of his audience means the educated and the not so educated. The people who pay five pounds to get in and the people who pay one pence to get in. So low comedy is geared towards the lower educated who give a big belly laugh over somebody tripping or getting punched or getting poked or getting slapped as well as the well-educated who like a good verbal joke. Okay? In A Midsummer Night's Dream, you have both. And you have both in the same scenes. That is, you have low comedy coupled with high comedy. you got to pay attention. For example, in the play within the play, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, you have to pay attention to some of the words, the rustic actors, the rude mechanicals as they are called, bottom and flute and snug, etc., they say. Because some of the comedy is high, they trip, they fall, etc., and uh, is low, they trip, they fall, etc., and some of it is high. They say things. Now, some of the things they say, they don't necessarily see the meaning we might see. Okay? In other words, Shakespeare uses a lot of double entendre. And the characters don't understand the double entendre, but the audience does. Okay? Um, tragedy, yeah, we can stop there. Okay, so let me do a little bit about Shakespeare's background. It's about five minutes left. Shakespeare's born around. We don't have his exact birth date. We are born around April 23rd, 1564. We know it's 1564. We know it's around April 23rd because we have his baptismal certificate. We don't have his birth certificate. Okay. We do know he died April 23rd, 1660. 52 years old. One of the reasons we kind of assume he was born April 23rd is because it gives us this nice balance. Okay? 
and because of what we know about baptismal ceremonies in his day, take the date of his baptismal certificate, go back a certain number of days, and it's pretty close. Here's one of the nice kind of serendipitous or ironic things about that. April 23rd is the patron saint day of St. George, of St. George and the Dragon Fang. St. George is the patron saint of England. Here you have the greatest writer in the English language, possibly being born on the patronal feast day of the saint of the country, or that is, the patronal feast day of the saint of the English language, the greatest writer in the English language. It's just, it's, it just works nice. Okay? 1582, <clears throat> November of 1582, he marries Anne Hathaway. He's 18. She's 26. 26 and unmarried in Shakespeare's day means she's pretty much a spinster. She, if she's not married by 25 or so, she's not going to get married. Okay? That's November. In February of 83, December, January, February, three months later, they have their first child. You do the math. It's a shotgun away. Okay. Eldest daughter, Susanna, born. Two years later, the twins, Hamnet, Hamnet, in, and Judith are born, 1585. Hamnet dies 11 years later. Okay. Judith lives a while longer. Susanna has children. Etc. Interestingly, Shakespeare's entire family line dies out by the end of the 1600s. There are no living heirs of Shakespeare today. Can you imagine if there were, you know? They'd be demanding royalty, I'm sure. Okay? So we, we, we have documentary evidence about all of this. That is, we've got signatures and papers and stuff. After the kids are born in 1585, it's like Shakespeare drops off the edge of the earth for seven years. We have nothing. We have no idea where he was, what he was doing. We have stories from 40 and 50 years after he dies about what he was doing during this period. But we have no proof. Like some people say, he was a school teacher. Some people say he was traveling the continent. Some people say he was a traveling actor during that period. But we don't have any evidence of that. Okay? What we do know is that in 1592, he's referred to in a publication in London. He's not referred to by name, William Shakespeare. He's referred to because this writer, a guy named Robert Greene, refers to an upstart crow who's feathered himself with our lines and who quotes, uh, uses this phrase that comes from one of Shakespeare's plays. He uses these two lines from one of Shakespeare's plays. And he says, you know, imagines himself as a shake scene in a country. Now, everybody takes that as being, he's talking about William Shakespeare. This guy who's writing this is dying. This is his kind of, his final word about how cruel the world is because it doesn't recognize my brilliance as a writer. He was a hack writer. He's angry because here's this young kid from, put it in United States terms, he's dying in the cultural capital, New York. Okay, And here's this young kid from Woodbury who's now taking over or taking New York by storm. Okay, that's essentially what he's saying Shakespeare is doing in London. All right? So from sometime around 1592 to about 1603, Shakespeare is a member of what is called the Lord Chamberlain's Men. The Lord Chamberlain is the second most powerful person in England, only behind the Queen. He is the patron of their acting company. That gives them some social status. 
Because actors weren't thought of in Elizabethan England like we think of actors today. Well, as some people think of actors today. They weren't held in high esteem, in other words. They were lowlifes. Okay? So this gives them some social status and protection. From 1603 until Shakespeare leaves London, he's part of the king's men. Why? The queen has died. King James becomes king of England. He becomes their patron. Now they have the patronage of the king. That elevates their status a little bit more. Okay? Um, and we'll stop there. I'll well, talk about the first volume of these two things, and then we'll jump into Midsummer Night's Dream. If there's a quiz on Wednesday, it'll be over what we did today. Try to read through...